All right, how's it going everybody? This is Byron Tenkink, and today we're going to be looking at writing your unknown microbe report. This presentation was originally put together by Isabel Raymond, Juliana Young, and Janie Lamb, and then it was produced and presented by yours truly. Now before we get started, there is a list of things that should be done before we go through this video, so just so we're all on the same page, if you haven't done one of these, then hit pause and go do that, and then come back. All right, first off, what you're going to want to do is read exercise 17 in your lab notebook regarding the format for your lab report, and then refer to that if you have any inquiry about format, marks, allocations, what you're required to include in your report, etc., etc., etc. So the rest of this walkthrough is going to be mostly just details and nitty-gritty type stuff. But if you have a question, the first place to look, exercise 17. There are also the overheads available online for download, which cover everything that was presented uh, during lab time. If you miss that, those overheads are available online. You're also going to want an outline written out, so before we start writing the report itself, there should be a skeleton to work from. Last and most importantly, double check the identity of your unknown organism before you start writing. So check the number, was it, you know, A1, B6, whatever, and then make sure that you've got the organism name right before you start writing. All right, so as far as what your report is going to look like, it's got to be at least four to five pages of text, double space, 12 point font, readable, just use a standard font, don't mess around with the fonts too much, and the figures can be included at the end of the report or incorporated into the text, but they are not included in the page count, so that four to five pages is text only. Now, spell check and grammar are two things that are very important and very overlooked all the time. Every single time we go to mark these, there are always points lost on what would otherwise be a perfectly good write-up, but there's spelling errors or there's grammar errors, and it's just completely unnecessary, and it's tragic, and it's completely avoidable. Another one of those nitty-gritty little details that are absolutely important, the species name format, it has to be italicized when you type it. It's underlined when you handwrite it, but when you're typing, a species name is always italicized. The genus is capitalized, the species is not, and it is always italicized. We cannot emphasize this enough. Finally, when you're writing up your references and citing your sources, you'll want to use the format from the Canadian Journal of Microbiology. If you look that journal up on PubMed, there are over 8,000 results, so pick one of those go to the reference section, and use that as your format. While you're there, go ahead and take a look at all the different titles, and you'll notice a pattern emerges. Titles are one of those things in scientific writings that are very distinct. They have to be done just a certain way, otherwise the entire paper looks bad. And in the real world, that usually means getting rejected and never getting published. So title, very good thing to learn early on. It's got to be informative and brief, and for the sake of this write-up, it has to include the unknown code. A vague title will lose you marks right away. For example, just saying the identification of an unknown culture says nothing distinct about what you were working on. An example of a better title would be the identification of unknown bacteria, whatever yours is, from the 12 candidate bacteria using a dichotomous key. It's got all your keywords in there, it's exact, it's unique, without being overly long and rambling. Now your abstract is usually written last, simply because it can be the toughest part to write out of the entire paper. You're basically trying to condense everything you've done into four or five really good sentences. It's got to be descriptive and informative, with no more than half a page. That's the absolute max. So, one paragraph condensing absolutely everything you've done, including a background, purpose, experimental approach, your key results, and what your conclusion is. And then also, for the sake of this write-up, you'll want to include the identity of your unknown bacteria in the abstract. Now, I know getting all of that into one paragraph sounds difficult, but it can be done. Let's go ahead and take a look at an example, and as you can see here, they've outlined every individual thing that you're going to need in your abstract, your background, purpose, 
your experimental approach, a quick rundown of your results, and then the conclusion, including the identity of your unknown. Now, there are a number of ways that the abstract can be done wrong. So for our next example, we're going to take a look at some of those common mistakes. All right, right at the beginning, we see a common error. It starts in first person. Scientific writing should never be written in first person. It's always got to be written in third person, past tense. The next mistake, the two bacteria are not italicized. This is, again, one of the simplest things that will lose you marks very quickly. And the next one is a grammar mistake. Reverse primers for the beta amylase gene and add ATTB. If you're just reading through it quickly, you won't catch it, but your grader will catch it, and it's just an absolutely unnecessary waste of good marks. Now then, at the end, we have a very weak sauce ending. We were able to obtain transform bacteria colonies. It's vague, but efficiency was low. This is more a dissection of the methods, not the results. And then some modification in methodology is required. Again, this is looking at your methods. It's not looking at your conclusion. It's not looking at what you were doing with this experiment. It's just extra fluff and it's a total waste of space in an abstract that can afford no wasted space. All right, moving on to the introduction. What you need for this section is one to one and a half pages, so about 600 words. Generally, you want to start out with a broad introduction to your topic and then narrow it down specifically into what exactly your paper will be covering. As with the abstract and with all scientific writing, you have to keep it in third person, got to keep it objective, and it's important to list all 11 possible unknowns in a table in your introduction. That's an important thing to have. Uh, that helps to define the scope of your project. You also want to include some background information on your subject or topic. Uh, generally, if this were a real-life scenario, you would look at what is the background of your uh, unknown bacteria, what were the situations surrounding the collection of this bacteria. In this case, because it's just a lab setting, you get to make up a backstory if you want, but keep it short, keep it scientific, and just include where was it, where was your unknown isolated, your significance about the species or group. Uh, you can be imaginative, but you know, keep it realistic. A couple things you absolutely cannot do without for your introduction, you're going to want to introduce the phenotypic versus phonetic approach to identifying the unknown. To get help with this, you can look at the Berge stuff that was put online, and you're also going to need a purpose sentence, just a one-sentence summary of what your paper is about. So, for example, in this experiment, an attempt was made to identify an unknown bacteria using phenotypic and biochemical properties. Usually the purpose sentence makes a good last sentence for your introduction. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at an example of a good introduction. Best thing to start out with is your subtitle. Introduction should start with introduction. Okay, then we jump into a backstory. Several members of a local Girl Guide troop complained of nausea and diarrhea after a weekend of camping. They were diagnosed with food poisoning. All these cases were traced to a single can of B4 canned peaches that was left open in the sun. So a little bit of backstory, giving your experiment a little bit of context, calling your organism by name, in this case B4, and then making a short list. Ooh, lit not list. <laughs> okay, no one's perfect. Uh, a short list of 12 bacteria was made, so referencing the 12 bacteria, and then referencing the Berge's manual whenever you talk about your dichotomous key. Again, introduction is a good place to talk about phonetic classification, and notice also the referencing uh, format. This is one that you're going to want to use for your write-up as well. Now, if making up a story isn't quite your speed, here's an example of another introduction where rather than go into the specific backstory. It starts with an overview of what is microbiology, down to its effects on humans, down to why we want to do what we were going to do in this experiment. And so again, general down to specific, and then hitting those key points of mentioning the phonetic system and explaining it a little bit, talking about what the name of your bacteria is, and then going into uh, what exactly you'll be looking for, morphological traits, culture requirements, biochemical activities, so on and so forth. 
All right, now for your materials and methods. This should be no more than around half a page to three quarters of a page. And there are a couple pointers uh, about the format for this. You have to refer to your dichotomous key in the text. That's an absolute must. Now, you're gonna wanna briefly describe what you did and then reference the lab manual. There's a proper citation for the lab manual. I'll get into that uh, in a, just a second. But also, confirmation tests that were done should be briefly described as well. Your dichotomous key is a figure. The confirmation tests can be made into a figure as well if you want, either a drawing or a picture. And any modifications, specifications, deviations from the instructions in the lab manual have to be stated. Let's look real quick at an example of what not to do before getting into a good example. All right, so the first example, first thing that you notice, point form. It cannot be done in a formal write-up for your materials and methods. It's okay for your lab notebook. It's not okay for your formal lab write-up. Now here's an example uh, down on the second line. See lab manual pages blah blah to blah. This is not a formal reference. Overall, also notice that this write-up is not very specific. It includes unnecessary details. Let's take a look at a better example. Alright, so first off, notice the paragraph format and also, and underlined in blue, every important detail is referenced. Also, uh, highlighted in green, it ref we reference our figures. Every single one of the pictures, the figures, have to be referenced. If not in the materials and methods, then elsewhere. Now, the proper citation for your lab notebook is here in red. You're going to want to remember this. And then in purple, notice the alterations that, you, that are done. Anything you do differently that's not explicitly cited in the lab manual, you'll want to make specific reference to it and be very clear about what different steps were done. All right, looking at your results now, you're not going to want more than a page worth of results. Around three quarters of a page ought to do it. And let's look at a few pointers here. You're going to want to state the findings of your study by concentrating on reporting your results without commenting on your findings. Commenting is reserved for the discussion section. How you did your experiment is reserved for your materials and methods. What you got, only what you got, is what you put in your results section. Now you are gonna to wanna to interpret your results just a little bit. Uh, for the sake of this report, it'll probably come down to making your observations and then interpreting whether or not that's a positive or a negative result. There should be a minimum of at least one table uh, in your results and then one figure, your gram stain. And then you'll, again, everything you put in as a table or a figure, you need to reference them in the text. Finally, the results is where you want to report the identity of your unknown. Make sure you have that in there somewhere before you finish your results. If we take a quick look at a good example of results, uh, here we've got a KOH test and just three sentences is all that's really needed. Some observations, some interpretations, and a few specific details, and then on to the next test. Now, if the results have a figure that goes along with it, you're going to want to reference your own figure, as you can see here in example two. Now, here in the next example, we see what a good table is supposed to look like. By the way, these tables and the figures will not count towards your page count. When we say three, and a ha uh, three quarters to uh, one page for results, that's still just text. So feel free to make the tables and figures as big as you want, and if your table looks something like this, then you're good to go. Now as for the figures, there are a few things that we'll be looking for. We need good use of labels, good use of arrows, nice descriptions, it should be neat, it should be clear. If your handwriting is not the best, then you'll probably want to look into typing it, and it should be easy to read. Now, when you're doing colony morphology, it's very important to use the list of terms. This figure here is taken straight from the lab manual, so use these words when you're describing. Again, as with the rest of the write-up, this is going to be all done in descriptive sentences, and you're going to want to describe the conditions of your plate as well as the colony morphology. The example here is broken out into colors. The blue section is just highlighting your observations, uh, what you're seeing. And the next section there, highlighted in green, is just saying whether or not the observations are consistent 
with other research that's been done. Now, all microbiology growth is gonna be somewhat diverse, so you're not gonna get exactly what the textbook says you're gonna get. So it's important that you explain away any inconsistencies that you might observe. An example of this is highlighted here in red. All right, moving on to the discussion. This should be about one to one and a half pages, but no more. Now, if the purpose of your research is to identify your unknown, in the discussion section, you get to prove to the reader and convince them that you have successfully identified that unknown. So this might require you to summarize your results, which you can do, just do not restate them, because that's boring. Also, this is your chance to analyze your results, discuss them within the context of your experiments, compare them to what is already known about the bacteria, compare them to what is known about the uh, test. Is the test historically accurate? Is it historically not? What might be a better one? Uh, all of this goes into your discussion. And make sure to keep the discussion confined to what your purpose stated. So you'll want to go back, reread your purpose, and make sure that your discussion fits what's stated in the purpose. Now, if you get to the end of your discussion and there aren't a whole bunch of references in the section, you've done something wrong. So you'll want to go back, do some more literature reading, and cite some references, at least Burgies, in your discussion section. This is also a chance to look at sources of error or also to speculate on potential future studies. Taking a look now at an example discussion section, the results and referencing the dichotomous key are all underlined here in red. And then in the green section, and in the green section, we see what the results ultimately lead to, uh, naming what the unknown most likely is. Finally, the blue section is showing the confirmatory test and going further than just what the results say, but interpreting it and explaining uh, that it's B. cateralis and not A. faecalis. The next example of a discussion here shows what a future studies sentence would look like. That's outlined here in green. All right, now to wrap up your report, your conclusion should be only about two to three sentences and it should be very succinct. You're just gonna state what your unknown was, relate it back to your purpose. Now don't just say that your purpose was successfully achieved, but go a little deeper with it. Say what your purpose was and why or how it was successfully achieved. And then in your introduction, if you'd started off with a backstory, you're gonna to wanna to tie up your story, at least mention it in the conclusion. Uh, if you didn't have it in the introduction, then don't bother with that here. Now, as mentioned in class, the references are just one of those sections that have to be absolutely perfect when it comes to formatting and propriety. Scientists base a lot of their career off of getting those references and those references uh, feed back into whether or not they get grants. So there are very good reasons that scientists want the references to be done just right. So anyway, for the sake of this report, there are guidelines of what's expected for this one. It's gonna be the Canadian Journal of Microbiology format. There are example papers on WebCT. There are tons more online. Finding them shouldn't be a problem. There's an example here of citing shown here in red. And then when you get to the very end and you're actually doing your reference section, there are separate formats for journal articles, for books, for manuals. There'll be different ones for other stuff as well, but journal article and book is gonna be the main two that you should be worried about. Here's the example of how they should be done. And again, any deviation from this format is wrong. The commas, the periods, what is bolded, the semicolons, every single part of this reference section is important. So just double and triple check this section before you hand it in. Also, it's worth mentioning the references are all supposed to be in alphabetical order. So make sure there's that as well. Now, last of all, don't forget to hand in your streak plate along with your report. A good streak plate should be not overly incubated. Uh, 24 to 48 hours should be exactly uh, right and then put in the fridge. There should be single colonies and it has to be labeled correctly and then sealed up with parafilm as well. For labeling your plate, you're gonna want these things. Make sure you have them all. Your full name, your lab session, your code number, tentative unknown identification, your incubation temperature, the growth media that you're growing it on, and then the date that you inoculated it. And that's it. Good luck writing your reports. If you have any more questions, be sure to email me. I'll leave my email address in the comment section.
And while you're here, feel free to click around on some of my other videos. There's some study guides that I did for the upcoming midterm. There's one on the final if you're a real keener. Uh, otherwise,